The 2016 season was one for the books. I ended up harvesting buck of a lifetime. We called him Curly, 180 inch buck. As I pursued Curly, there was always this other buck kind of in the back of my mind. And he's a real unique buck. Uh, we put him at maybe three and a half years old, just kind of showed up on camera. He had two double splits on each of his G2s, so we called him double split. And throughout this whole process of hunting for Curly, we really got to know this buck really well, had several encounters, and we kind of used the 2016 season to learn more about this deer and gathered information that we could take moving forward. You know, always keep an eye on bucks that you're not willing to shoot or not after that specific season. Use that data moving forward, and that's exactly what we did for this double split buck. There's typically only room for one dominant buck on a property this size, and when I was able to harvest curly, the hopes were for this you know, next season that hopefully double splits would survive the long winter and come back and, and become the, the most mature dominant buck on the property. So we started running trail cameras in 2017, and sure enough, in August that summer, double splits showed back up. We're excited because he's a four-year-old buck. We look at four-year-old bucks here in Minnesota as a mature deer, and, and that's something we definitely want to target. You know, he lost the splits, which, which was a little disappointing, but it's, it's good that he made it through the winter, didn't die of, you know, disease or infection, and we got something to chase in 2017. Now, the reason we like to run our trail cameras on video mode is because it shows a lot more information than just one second in time. So a lot of the videos we were capturing a double split were only on one trail camera, and it was showing him past in certain directions. So in the morning, he was always heading back to bedding, so we knew where that typically was. And in the evening, his travel direction was back towards food, so we know where that line of travel was. So, you know, we, we had this spot on the property that was very specific to where he was traveling, and we knew that this was probably the, the location where we we're gonna get our shot at this buck. And a lot of these videos actually showed a buck would walk through the camera and then you wait a few seconds and you know a lot of times double splits would come through and he would have his ears pinned back showing a lot of aggression and it just showed you know this is the most dominant buck in the area. He's pushing pretty much every deer off of this little plot. He's gonna be aggressive, he may be callable and I think you know if we get the right conditions to get him up on his feet during daylight we're probably gonna get a shot at this buck. So the Minnesota season, archery season, actually opens up mid-September. And you know, a lot of people wanna just jump in the stand right away, get out there for opener. But we, we kept looking at the data on the cameras and it just, there was no daylight activity. And you know, it's, it's something you just can't go in there and, and push deer out and hunt and put your scent on the ground and educate these deer. So it was just a, it was just a waiting game at that point. And it wasn't until early October, which is, you know, three weeks later, that we finally had the right conditions where he started to show up a little bit closer to daylight. And we figured, you know, if we have a cold front, high pressure system, we have the moon on our side, you know, those are the factors that we can use to jump in at, at the right spot at the right time and actually get a good chance at this deer. And having that patience, I think, is going to pay off. So on October 4th, we had a temp drop. I think it was like 12 degree drop. The wind direction change was actually a pretty cool factor too because it was extremely windy that day, midday, but the forecast showed that it was gonna drop those last few hours of daylight. So that presents an opportunity to jump in when it's really windy, use that for access, for concealment, for movement and cover on your way in. And then once I access that stand and I'm in the stand, then the wind's gonna die down high pressure and temperatures are dropping. It just lines up to be a really good opportunity. So the interesting thing about this stand and this setup is actually it's just a clump of trees that are growing up in a low spot. The clump of trees is kind of out in the open with just CRP and grass surrounding the whole area. So hunting a spot like this, deer can access and walk by you from every direction. So scent control is a big factor and there's really no perfect wind direction to play. So. As I entered this setup, I knew my wind direction was actually going to be blowing over a food source that I was hunting over. Scent control is huge when you're in a location like this where deer can really show up on all directions and walk around. It's a little bit of an island kind of a deal. And using the phase system, the body washes, the shampoos, conditioners back at home, and then cleaning the gear. And then last step is, is the field foam in the tree, and that's what's going to suppress our dander keep that down on our skin, kind of control, hydrate our skin, encapsulate our odor molecules one more time when we get to the tree. We sweat a little bit on the way in, so we use the field foam, 
And as you can see, I take the wind checker out and my wind's blowing right over the plot. And that's just where it has to be tonight for this sit and hopefully we can pull it off. So there's still quite a bit of daylight and two bucks show up from the east and they're walking my direction and they're, they're, they're about to hit that downwind stretch in the food plot where there's no wall, there's no screen. You know, this is test one of the night. I know that if I can pass the test on some small bucks, some does, you know, that's really what's gonna either lead to success or failure later on if I get a chance at a big buck. So these two bucks walk in, year old bucks, directly downwind, never lifted their nose, anything like that. So by removing all my human odor, using that phase system with the field foam direct to my skin, I'm able to, you know, really conceal all that odor, remove my human presence, and as these bucks walk in, they're directly downwind. Perfect test. We passed it, and now we're going to see what happens. So these little bucks clear off, and it was at about sunset. I just happened to look back and catch a little bit of movement behind me, and double splits was actually right behind me, 40 yards heading the wrong direction. And I'm kind of thinking, oh man, like there's, like how am I going to pull him through me when he's already back towards the food that he wants to be at tonight? So I kind of, you know, I'm a little bit stressed, a little bit panicked, and I grab my black racks, but it's only October 4th. So I'm thinking, you know, there's no way I can rattle a buck in October 4th. But I thought, you know, maybe if I just spar a little bit, like how can I pull him back to this scenario? So now I'm looking back and I can't see him at this point. Just light sparring, 30 seconds, take a break, couple grunts out of the extinguisher. I'm thinking, you know, probably, probably not gonna happen. Just he's already where he wants to be. Next thing I know, I look up and I see movement again. Now he's circling in from my south, going right by that trail camera that these other bucks exited. And he comes in on a pretty fast walk. He pushes a button buck into the plot. Remember, this is an extremely aggressive buck. He's the most dominant buck in the area. He heard that sparring, that little light rattling, and he thought, you know, I need to come in here and at least show my dominance and, and push whatever deer is out of the area. Double splits begins to circle to my downwind side. Grab my bow double splits walking in and I have a nice gap at about 20 yards, 25 yards, and he's about to hit it. And I'm thinking, you know, he's about to hit my downwind trail, downwind scent cone. I pull my bow back, heart's just pounding, and I'm, I can't believe first time in, I'm about to get a shot at my target buck. When I saw that arrow hit, I knew exactly what happened. Perfect double lung shot my number one target buck, first day on the stand, runs 50, 60 yards, and, and it's all over. Oh, baby. I just shot the target buck we were in here after. Oh my God, that was freaking awesome. I circled down when he's directly down when I'm gonna take my wind checker out and show you. I shot that sucker. I just shot double split directly down when that was freaking crazy. I think a big key to success in harvesting double split was actually the, the history and all the scouting data that we had from the year past and earlier in this season. Knowing kind of where he travels, where he beds, using all that together to kind of see that this buck is the dominant deer, this is how he uses the area, and this is how he interacts with other bucks was a big key to, to moving in on this deer. Another key to success was just waiting for the right time to get in. Our season opened three weeks prior to my first sit, even trying to shoot double split. So, you know, being patient, waiting until he shows up in daylight, whether that's scouting or on trail camera, you know, waiting for that time and being efficient and making the most out of the first sit. Because the first sit in is always the best if you can maximize that first hunt. Finally, when it comes to the location we were at, like I said earlier, is a 360. So a buck could come in from any direction or deer. And scent control, you know, having deer in early that actually came directly downwind, not smelling us, the access in and out, and using that phase system to just remove all human odor is a big part of, of going in and having a successful hunt. Now, as far as the communication part goes along with that, it all plays hand in hand. I never was busted by this deer in years past. I never communicated with him. And then when the 2017 opportunity came, where I rattled him in, called him in, it all led to success because he wasn't aware, he wasn't educated in the past. So low key strategies leading up to the hunt and then using the tools correctly, that's really a huge key to success in what finally closed the deal, put him at 22 yards downwind. So having that understanding of, of this buck so well over two years and all the scouting, 
all the preparation that went into this hunt and then being able to really close the deal, get the job done on the first time in is just such a rewarding feeling with all that hard work and effort I've put in the last two years hunting this deer.